Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Bethany and I'm with the NC Serials Conference Planning Committee. Um, just so you know you're in the right place, this is concurrent session 3B, Library Open Access Funding on the Ground. We will have time for questions and answers at the end, so please put any questions you have in the Whova chat and we will address those at the end of the session. Um, but for now, I will hand it over to Matthew and Curtis. Thank you. Well, thank you, Bethany, and thanks for everyone for being here today and for um, the folks who are actually putting this on. So, so I'm Curtis Brundy. I am the Associate University Librarian for Scholarly Communications and Collections at Iowa State. Um, I oversee the collections program, uh, technical services, as well as uh, the majority, I would say, of our scholarly communication efforts. And, and with me today is, is Matthew Goddard. He's the department head for access and acquisition. So today we're going to be talking about open access workflows, a topic um, that we think is of growing relevance and interest to many libraries in the U.S. I think that most of us probably recognize by now that the move to open access is finally underway. Um, I think in alignment with you know, our values around equity and openness and intellectual freedom, um, there really is more of a growing expectation that libraries convert this previous uh, spend that went to help you know, erect paywalls, uh, that we redirect that spend toward you know, more values aligned uh, open access investments. Um, I think you know, the, the time for libraries to be actively contributing to this information landscape of haves and have nots, you know, really needs to come to an end. Um, next slide, Matthew. So Iowa State is a signatory of OA 2020. Um, we're committed to transitioning our previous subscription spend to support for open access. And we're doing this in a variety of ways where we've launched a new digital press um, we're supporting open access infrastructure, and we're making open access agreements. Um, I like to think of this as a multimodal strategy, which I think is probably the direction most libraries are going to need to take. You know, there's not one path, you know, to, to move our spending toward open access. So for our open access agreements, uh, we currently have, you know, depending on how you categorize them, we have in the ballpark of 15. Um, and they utilize a variety of models from subscribe to open to read and publish and, and things in between. So we started making these agreements in 2019. So the chart to the left shows the number of articles in our first year of making these types of agreements um, that was made open access. So 86 corresponding authored Iowa State articles were covered under that first year of our agreements. And you can see the growth just in a couple of years of doing this. You know, we've doubled. Uh, and we doubled in 2020, then we doubled again in 2021. Um, for 2022, I don't think we're going to double to 800 covered articles. We're not quite, we're not going to be able to keep up this pace, but there will be additional growth. And of those corresponding authored articles, the bar charts to the right show what that percentage is of the total um, corresponding authored output at, at Iowa State. So you can see, and I got to slide my windows over here. You can see that in 2021, um, that those 409 articles, that represented 20% of the total um, corresponding authored output for, for Iowa State. So we have a lot of, we, we still have a lot of, a long ways to go, right? We still have 80% of the articles uh, to go, but um, what we're gonna be talking about today are these underlying workflows that we have had to put in place just to support this 20%. Um, next slide, Matthew. So a big question that we had to deal with, you know, as we were scaling up uh, in making these agreements is, you know, where does this work involve, which Matthew is going to go into a lot more detail what, what these workflows actually are. Where does this work, where should it reside in the library? Um, and when we started out, you know, back to the thinking of the pie chart where that first year we only did 86 articles. Well, when we started out, um, we had pieces of those workflows that were split across. You know, we had some of it with our scholarly communication librarian who actually resides in a separate division from the division Matthew and I are in. 
um, there's a dotted line from my position to hers, but, you know, she is in research and instruction, you know, but for getting started, it made sense for that person to help out. Uh, her, her name is Abby Elder. Um, it made sense for her to help out, but as, you know, back to that chart, as we started scaling this up, you know, this was not scalable. And we realized that we needed to, to be able to scale it, you know, we needed to move it someplace where we had the capacity to do it. So we ended up moving the work to our electronic resources unit. And that's what my, and this is my hand drawn org chart that I'm very proud of, but that's the arrow that's swinging over to 2020 in the middle of the screen. So advantages to putting this type of work in the electronic resources unit. First, after, in our case, after shifting some responsibilities around, we actually had a little bit of staff time that we could allocate and permanently reassign to doing some of this work. Second, our ER unit staff, they actually brought a lot of expertise and experience working with publishers, working with publisher platforms. And finally, the ER unit you know, already worked really closely with the collections program. Um, they already worked with us on licensing. They worked with us on access. So making the transition um, of these new responsibilities and workflows into this particular unit uh, actually was pretty seamless for us. And I think that as a research library, we're fairly conventionally organized. Um, so not to say that this would necessarily work in your library, but I think it's definitely worth a consideration if you're trying to figure out where to situate these types of workflows. And Matthew's going to take it from here. Great. Thanks, Curtis. So um, what I'd like to do now is um, walk you through some of the specific tasks or workflows or processes that are required in order to make these kinds of agreements successful. Um, and as you can see from this list, there's quite a few to go through. Um, and we, our, our time is somewhat limited. We're gonna limit it even further because we wanna leave lots and lots of time at the end for questions. Um, we think that's one of the most beneficial aspects of conferences like this. So um, as I go through these, um, I, I'm gonna try to you know, provide as much context and, and detail as time allows, but I have a feeling that questions you know, will come up. So when that happens, I, I really hope that you put those questions into the, into the chat and we'd really love to be able to address those um, at the end. So, um, Again, so these are some of the, the, the workflows that are required. We're gonna be talking about, about each of these. Um, and then we're gonna also talk about um, a couple um, tools that are emerging, a couple, kind of categories of tools that are emerging that are helping to lay the groundwork for the kind of scalable, more complete transition that Curtis was describing. And we'll, we'll finish up by very, very briefly describing some key differences between some of our different agreements here at Iowa State and um, the, the, the ramifications of those differences on some of these workflows. So it's, it's a lot to cover, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to be as, as clear as I can and not talk too fast. Um, so here at Iowa State, we actually have Curtis, uh, currently 17 agreements that uh, fund the open access publication of our institutional research. It was 15, but we actually just recently added two small read and publish agreements. And so that's really what we're talking about is we're, we're, we're funding the open access publication of our institutional research. and Within that category of 17, there's actually quite a bit of variety. You know, there's a lot of experimentation going on right now, a lot of different models and a lot of different, um, you know, subtle differences between these agreements. Um, but within that category of 17, all of these workflows on, that are listed here apply to all of them, except for eligibility verification. That one is a little bit contingent on one factor that I'll describe when we get there. Um, but other than that, what I'm talking about covers all of those agreements that um, are funding our institutional research. Um, we're going to spend the most time, I think, probably on that eligibility verification step. That's that one is is uh, very key. And I will also, um, well, let's see. I guess I added. So author identification is a little bit of an exception, and we'll describe why when I when we get there. Um, so let's go ahead and jump into uh, agreement negotiation. So. Um, you know, originally what I wanted to do was give you an in-depth description of all of the different um, specific clauses that we try to get included in our open access agreements once the basic structure is in place, you know, defining the cost and defining the basic, you know, in terms of, of what we're getting for those costs. Um, and I realize that there's really, that, that could be a whole session in itself. So we, we're not going to get into that level of detail here talking about the specific agreement. Um, some specific clauses probably will come up a little bit later um, when, we, when, when, when relevant. But um, 
at the moment, I just want to describe, so like Curtis was describing here in, in the access and acquisition department, the e-resources unit, we are um, handling the license review process. And so like probably many of you, we have a, a license review checklist where we have the um, key clauses that are, are of particular concern to us that we want to make sure that we get right in the agreement. And so we, uh, we have that checklist and we apply the exact same checklist to our open access agreements. There's just some specific open access specific clauses that are applicable only to these kinds of open access agreements. Um, but otherwise it's the, the same uh, process. So once the agreement's in place and the, the term has begun, the, the publisher needs to, within their own local submission systems, set up some mechanism for identifying submissions that are eligible for open access publication under the agreement. And so this is sort of the one that I mentioned earlier. This is a sort of an exception. This is not really a, a library workflow. This is something that the publishers are responsible for. for responsible for. And uh, so it's, it's a very important step because this is gonna determine what, uh, what even comes onto your radar as uh, relevant to these different agreements. And so you can sort of think of it like, uh, I think it's, there's a useful analogy here with IP addresses. So in the world of resources, we have IP addresses, and that is the way that publishers have of associating a specific uh, user session with a specific institution, and from there to a specific contract that provides, you know, ensures that that person should have access to specific content. So it's the same sort of thing here, where we're trying to associate a specific, not a, not a, you know, web browser session, but a uh, a, a submission to a journal. But same, or same sort of thing where we're trying to associate it with a specific institution and a specific contract. And unfortunately, in this world right now, there's no nothing like IP addresses. So there's there's no real um, perfect solution to doing this. And there are two main ways this, that publishers have of doing this, and that's the email domain and institutional ID. So email domain, um, you know, when we start, are starting one of these agreements, one of the questions we're asked by the publisher is what what email domains do your researchers use? And so we'll say, well, they use iastate.edu. And so when a corresponding author submits a paper using that email address, it gets flagged as being eligible under our agreement. The other main way is, uh, is um, it, using an institutional ID. And the way this works is, so uh, your corresponding author, you have your submission form where you're filling out all of the information about yourselves and your co-authors and your submission. And one of those fields is affiliation. And instead of having just a free text field where you type in Iowa State University, you'd have a, a drop-down menu. And ideally, that drop-down menu would be populated by an institutional registry, so like Roar or Ringgold. So when they select Iowa State University from that drop-down, there's a specific unique ID that can be used to associate the uh, submission with the institution and from there with the contract and get it. Um, it included under the contract, un, under the, the agreement and, and flagged by the, by the publisher. Um, we prefer that uh, publishers use both of these methods. Uh, that's particularly the case because as we know, uh, many of our researchers prefer to use their personal email address for their, uh, the, the email address that they uh, have as their corresponding author email address because they might not plan to be at this university forever and they want to be able to receive correspondence about their research after they leave. So that's why we really need to, multiple methods of, of uh, flagging these submissions. And so we really encourage publishers to use both of these. If, it's, if it fits in either category, um, um, cast a wide net. And it really that's really true regardless of the structure of the agreement. We want publishers to catch, cast a really wide net here because the next step is um, eligibility verification. And this is the step where the library has the opportunity to be able to say whether or not this particular submission should be applied to the agreement. So if the publisher catch, casts a really wide net with their process, then we're able to then define our own, um, our own criteria for deciding what actually gets applied to the agreement. And this, so this step of eligibility verification, where we're saying yes or no, apply it to the agreement, um, 
is generally only necessary for agreements that are capped or APC based. So these are agreements where there's a specific maximum number of articles that can be published under the agreement, um, or maybe the agreement is um, based on APC costs. So every time an article is published under the agreement, a certain dollar amount is drawn down from a deposit based on the APC for that journal. So in both of those cases, uh, you have limited resources, right? So you you don't want to um, you don't want to uh, you you need to be able to define uh, you need to be able to say yes or no uh, and, and control how you're using those scarce resources, um, and and that's so that's in contrast to agreements like um, we have several. Actually, I think right now it's currently the majority of our agreements are uncapped. So there is no limitation on what can be published under the agreement. It's just we pay a certain amount to cover all publishing that meets the criteria of the agreement during the term. And so regardless of the um, number of submissions or publications, those will get published. And so there's really no incentive here in the library to say, well, no, 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 don't apply that to our agreement. That's not eligible. That doesn't fit the criteria that we've, that we've defined. Um, because there's there's no uh, resource limitations. So I think it's important for libraries to maintain the ability to say yes or no, and also um, to be able to define what criteria they're using to say yes or no. And I think that's it's an important point that relates back to the agreement, because some, some agreements uh, that publishers are, are using try to specify that libraries will take this step, that you will, um, say yes or no, but we want the option to be able to say, well, no, this agreement, we're just going to auto approve everything. If it looks good to the publisher, we're going to publish it. Um, but in other cases, we might want to um, have more control and we might want to be able to flexibly define that control over the course of a term, um, depending on, you know, for example, let's say we realize that we're going to run out of funds halfway through the year. Theoretically, you might want to um, narrow down the, the scope of what you're um, approving. And okay, so what does this actually look like for, for us and my staff? Um, it's it, there typically uh, publishers will have uh, a dashboard where you would go in and be able to view the details of the submission and be able to say yes or no. These dashboards might be um, proprietary and locally developed by each publisher. There are also some third party products that um, they can use. One that seems to be popular with several of our publishers um, are using uh, copyright clearance centers rights link. And so you, in either case, you would go in and you would receive an email notification saying this has been accepted and it seems to be eligible. Please verify that we can apply it to your agreement. And then you just log in and say yes or no. In our case, our criteria locally are, are very simple. We, we only are looking to see, to make sure that they're actually an Iowa state person. And so we would just look them up in our institutional directory and if they're there we'd say yes otherwise we would just say no um, not all of our publishers have that kind of dashboard interface some of them uh, the smaller ones especially might just rely on on email okay so moving on we've um, another important step is invoicing i'm really not going to say anything about this i mean it's pretty straightforward you've got to pay the bills um, there are differences in the frequency of invoicing that are related to the structure and size of the deal Obviously, a read and publish agreement, generally, you're only going to be paying that like an annual renewal, um, just like you did before with your, your, you know, your journals package renewal. Um, so moving on to, to reporting. So reporting here, we're talking about uh, um, being able to assess the value of the deal and also monitor your spend, monitor your use of that deal throughout the year. And to do that, you need to know um, what's being published under that agreement. So you're looking for article level metadata. You, you, the, the basic unit is, is cost per article. So in, you know, again, in the e-resources world, we have cost per use. That's sort of the basic unit of analysis. It's not the end of the story, obviously, but it's kind of the, the starting point for most of basic analysis of, of assessing value. So with these agreements, you're looking at cost per article, but there's, the, the issue here is there's no counter standard for, for um, sharing out this kind of information. And so this step, I think more than all the other workflows that I'm describing is probably, it's certainly the most open-ended uh, and probably the most uh, laborious of these different workflows. And 
because what ends up happening is you have, you know, you have 17 different publishers and each of them um, is going to be sending you article level metadata about what's been published under the agreement. But there's gonna be a lot of variation between um, what, what data is included, like what, what fields are included, how those fields are, are formatted, you know, wh where, what order the Excel columns are in, um, and also just how frequently it's sent. So we have some uh, agreements that where you know, we can go into this, that same dashboard and run our own self-service reports, which is nice. We have others that might send a monthly spreadsheet. Uh, we have some that uh, send a, a, an annual spreadsheet. Some don't send anything unless we specifically ask them for it. And you know, then, then you're, you end up with all these different spreadsheets that then in order to get sort of a comprehensive view across all of your, your, your open access portfolio, you, want to, you need to be able to kind of munge that together into a, a, a single um, set of data. And that's just a, a we found that to be a, a bit of a pain point um, for implementing these agreements. And so that's why I want to just um, switch gears a little bit to talk about a, two different categories of systems that are emerging that are going to help um, not only with this reporting problem that I described, but hopefully other um, things as well. And the first of those is, is on the left here. That's the OA switchboard. So if you're not familiar with the switchboard, this is a, it's not a product for sale. It's a, it's a piece of shared community infrastructure. So it's a, a centralized data exchange hub that facilitates the exchange of messages between research funders, institutions, and publishers. And right now there are two main kinds of messages. One message goes from the publisher to the institution saying, is this eligible to be, to be um, counted against your agreement? And that's a two-way message. Then the institution says yes or no. The other message is simply uh, from the one way from the publisher to the institution saying, um, this has been published under your agreement. And the beauty of the, the switchboard is that it really um, allows, it, it allows publishers to standardize what they're doing, uh, or sorry, they don't need to standardize what they're doing because they can just send everything to the switchboard. And then when it goes to the switchboard, it will be standardized um, by virtue of having gone through this messaging hub. And um, what, it, what, it, what it's not is it is not primarily a front end uh, interface. It's not a dashboard, not, not primarily. That's not how it's been designed. And that's really more what, what you see on the, on the right. So there are uh, this emerging category of um, open access management systems. Um, and the three that I'm aware of are OABLE, Kronos Hub, and, and OA Metrics. Those are the ones that I'm aware of that specifically uh, cater to the um, institutional and library market. There are others like RightsLink that really cater more to the publisher market. But these are uh, dashboards where you can go in and do that verification step. You can um, potentially streamline payments. So we use here at Iowa State Oable, um, and which is a product of uh, Knowledge Unlatched, recently acquired by Wiley. And those, um, we have a deposit with them. And so some of our smaller agreements where we're not doing as much volume, we can just draw down that deposit and streamline our payments for those smaller agreements. So these tools I think are, are gonna be really key to that broader transition and really um, as, as, as more publishers get signed into, connected to the, to the switchboard, um, it'll make it a lot easier on our end to use tools like Oable as, in a centralized way to look at reporting across our, our entire um, open access portfolio. So this is, um, you know, sort of before and after you can sort of see the, the difference that theoretically the switchboard can make. Um, and we're currently somewhere in the middle. So we have, I think it's roughly half and half right now between publishers that are integrated and, and, and publishers that are, are not. Um, so we look forward to more and more publishers getting connected to the switchboard and see that as pretty key to this broader transition. Okay, so now returning back to, to the workflows. So I just have two more to, to mention, and these are both workflows that happen after the, the submission has actually been published. And the, and the first of those is institutional repository deposits. So uh, 
you know, here at Iowa State, we see it as important to be stewards of our institutional research ourselves. And so as much as possible, we want that institutional research to be in our institutional repository. And of course, part of the, the, the submission process is uh, the assignment of a Creative Commons license to all of these submissions. And so that Creative Commons license facilitates um, a, a pretty, pretty straightforward uh, you, you can do a pretty straightforward harvesting of uh, submissions into the institutional repository. And you can do that in a manual way. You can also do it in an automated way uh, via the, the SWORD protocol. And I, to be honest with you, I cannot speak with a lot of authority on that protocol. We have, been, we have had uh, an institutional repository that has not had that functionality. And we just moved to a, a digital repository that does have that functionality and we're currently working out how to implement it. Um, essentially, it's, it's a protocol that facilitates the direct deposit um, from the publisher platform into, the, um, into our institutional repository. And the, the publishers need to, um, in order, I think in order for it to work, they need to be signed onto it. So they, they need to actually need to do something on their end to really trigger this deposit. And so this is something, another thing that's important to get included in your agreement is to ask them at, at the, in the beginning of the agreement before you even sign to um, do this kind of direct deposit. Okay, so the last uh, workflow I, I'll mention is, is open access verification. And this one is very, very, very important. Essentially what I'm saying is what, what we do is once something has been um, published and once it's showed up on our reports from these publishers, we then go in and verify on the publisher platform that it is indeed open access. And this has proven to be a very important step. And I think it comes down to the fact that publishers are still really figuring out a lot of this as they go. There's a lot of, um, I think a lot of building the plane midair going on. And so it, I've frankly been a little surprised at how frequently things show up on our reports as having been published open access under our agreement, but then you go and look at on the platform and it's not actually open access. So we're currently doing this in a, in a manual way. Um, and we look forward to OABLE uh, implementing something that we've discussed with them where they, it should be possible to do a, a more automated check of the open access status of these publications. So those are the that's a really high level, uh, quick overview of the different things that we're doing to, to make sure that these agreements um, are successful. Now I just want to very, very quickly go through um, four different differences between these agreements and how those differences might affect um, some of our, our workflows. And I think the probably the, the most important one is whether or not your agreement is capped or uncapped. So whether or not there's that sort of um, scarce resource built into the agreement itself that is going to um, cause you to uh, really need to look very closely at what get published under that agreement in order to carefully manage those, those scarce resources. So um, really, I guess that's, that's really all I need to say about that. You have, um, with, with the capped agreements, there's that eligibility verification step that is really quite important. Um, and you're also going to want to monitor your spend throughout the year to make sure that you're not going to, to run out of money or, or hit your article cap. Um, on the other hand, with uncapped agreements, you have uh, an incentive to maximize your eligible articles, at the very least by just skipping out on the eligibility verification step that I described. Um, and maybe you, know, you might want to consider promoting that agreement uh, to your researchers in order to really you know, get, the, get the most value from it since it won't necessarily cost you more. Um, another important difference is whether or not our agreements are integrated with those systems I mentioned earlier. Um, workflow implications for that difference are pretty straightforward. If it is integrated, we're able to manage that centrally via um, OABLE and we're able to get that integrated reporting that we're looking for. But then of course, there are some that are not integrated. And so we have to manage those separately and, and use those manual reporting processes that I described before. This one's also pretty straightforward. So is there, a, is there a read component? Is it a read and publish agreement? We have both read and publish, and we also have um, 
agreements with pure OA publishers that where there are no, um, there's no content licensing that's associated with our agreement. So obviously if there is a read component, you're, there's traditional e-resources management processes that are going to be required in order to um, you know, implement that e-resources access. And you're also gonna uh, have two different sources of value when you're assessing you know, what, your, what your return on investment is from that agreement. You're gonna have both the cost per use, of course, from the read side, but then also the cost per article on the, the published side. And for our pure OA agreements where there is no read component, um, uh, I think that's you know, clearly you're going to have very little e-resources management required for those. Um, and you're also you're just going to have that one non-traditional, if you will, source of um, value. And so you're going to have to be thoughtful about how you assess these, these agreements. And finally, this is um, not only a difference between agreements, this is also a difference between journals within agreements. So this is uh, the difference of, of whether a, a journal is um, open access, fully open access or, or hybrid. And this is really an important distinction for authors. Uh, and it, the workflow implications are primarily um, related to the author experience. So when somebody, someone submits to a fully open access journal, uh, there, there are higher stakes because that APC invoice has to be paid. Um, this actually came up literally about an hour ago where there was a, some, some kind of error with one of our publishers and it, it, they, they had in their system, it had been, um, it looked at it like it had been rejected under our eligibility verification step. And turns out that when that error happened, the author, the corresponding author, um, essentially got a, an email asking her to pay this like $3,000 invoice when, when she had no plans to do so. And I don't think she was in a field flush with federal research dollars. And so that's you know, obviously something we wanna avoid. And so that's just something that on, on our end, we need to be aware that those things can happen and we need to have a plan for, for how to address them. Um, in this case, it sounds like Oxford is going, <laughs> I didn't mean to actually say the, uh, the publisher, but anyways, uh, the publisher is going to uh, uh, remedy the situation since it does seem to have been, been the result of a problem on their end. Um, for hybrid journals, you have almost the opposite problem. So the stakes are much lower and we found that our researchers are, um, you know, we have the, the ones who are really gung ho about open access and are going to do everything possible to make sure that it gets published open access. But then I, I think we have a lot of researchers that are um, somewhat indifferent and are not necessarily going to um, really look carefully at, at the submission process to make sure that they do what needs to happen in order to have something published under the agreement. And so that what that means is that the submission experience, the way the publisher designs their submission workflow for their authors becomes extraordinarily important because they really they need to be able to do that initial identification matching up the author with the institution and then they need to be able to steer that author as as strongly as possible to the open access route and make it as clear as possible that they will not be receiving an invoice um, so that is a, a um, really what we wanted to cover today um, I hope that that was somewhat um, relevant and, and useful. Um, and I believe we now have some time for questions. Yes, thank you so much, Matthew and Curtis. That was very interesting. And we do have time for questions and we already have a few in the chat. So if you're attending and you have questions, please remember to put that in the Whova chat. Uh, but we can start with the first question. Any idea how many eligible papers are missed that is could have APC covered by Iowa State, but they were identified incorrectly? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and one, one thing that we do when we're um, doing reporting, so we try to do quarterly reports where we're comparing um, our different agreements. And we look at, I, I don't think I could give you like a specific number, um, but what we, try to look at is the data in um, an index like dimensions, or you might also use like you know, web of science or scopus 
and see what is being published at Iowa State under this publisher in this time frame, and what's being actually published under our agreement and looking at that, that ratio. And that ratio should be fairly consistent across publishers. And there was one, uh, I'm not going to say the name of this publisher. Uh, there was one uh, example last year where uh, the, the ratio was very low and, and we it was really raised some red flags. I thought, why, why are we we're doing X number of you know, papers with this publisher, but only this many are actually getting applied to the agreement, what's going on? And we went to the publisher and, and it turned out to relate to the um, submission experience, which I was just mentioning. The authors were not being steered to choose the open access route. They were being, they were basically be, being given a menu and with no, no guidance of, of um, you know, being able to, of, of, of the fact that they were, had the ability to publish open access for free. And if I could add in a piece here, this is something that's being discussed by the libraries that are making these types of agreements. I think when these agreements were first being made, there was this sense that because of academic freedom, authors really needed to be given a decision point in the process where, sure, default could be open access, but they would be able to opt out and put their research, their publication behind the paywall if they decided to do that. And I think in, in principle, that's fine. I think what's happened in practice, just as Matthew was saying, is there has been some really confusing author workflows as a result of that, where sometimes it's not clear to the author, unless it's done really well, that in publishing open access, they may equate that with incurring an APC themselves. So this needs to be done really well in order not to confuse authors. And, and I am coming down, you know, I'm starting to think in terms of, you know, we have not had an author yet on our campus who has told us that they want to be able to opt out of publishing open access. What we hear from our authors is we love what you're doing. We want the, your support in publishing open access. So to me, this is like a step that I think in the coming years, like maybe as these types of agreements and workflows become you know, more standard, that authors will just be okay being routed right in underneath the institutional agreement and it's published open access and they don't actually have to hit this decision point that does seem to cause some confusion. Thank you. There's another question. You said publishers are labeling some articles OA when they are not. For what percent of articles does this happen? Curious how widespread this is and what is the source of the OA status if you know? Yeah, so they're, they're not labeled OA on, on any sort of public platform. They're not labeled OA on the publisher platform. They're, they're labeled OA in, in the reporting that we're receiving from the publisher. So the publisher is giving us a list of articles saying, here's what's been published under your agreement and we'll go and, and verify and, and so on, on. So that's where that difference is coming in. Um, it, it really varies by, by publisher. Um, and it, it's not a high percentage. I'm trying to think of if, how I might be able to give you a ballpark. Um, yeah, I, certainly less than you know, 5% of the total are, are in this category. It's, it, it, it's higher than I'd expect though. I wouldn't expect, I don't know, I wouldn't expect any. Um, but I, I think I'm thinking of a, one publisher where we do maybe like 50, 50 articles or so. And I think they had like two, but it, but some publishers have a, a, a you know, have this handled much better. And, you know, it, it also, it's also going to relate to if, if a publisher is switching, maybe they might be switching from one submission system to another, and that might have, have, a, have an effect on this process as well. So it's hard to give a specific number. And publishers are definitely at, you know, different stages with trying to switch over their systems. They're also, you know, facing, significant different resource constraints. And so a publisher like Wiley that is really going all in on the transition to open, they've poured a lot of money into their platforms and their systems and figuring out how to make them work. And then you have 
you know, other publishers, you know, especially smaller publishers, some of them are running manual processes here to try and, you know, connect the dots between, you know, an institutional agreement and what the article is. And so when you have someone having to sort through a list and manually flip switches to make it all work, you know, there's going to be errors. We have a couple more questions, but I just wanted to share a helpful comment in the chat. We just signed our first read and publish agreement and your talk has answered all of my questions about what's to come. So that's wonderful. Um, yes, another question, you. could you mention some of the open access specific clauses you've added to your agreements? Yes, I have a list right here in fact, because it was originally part of my outline. Um, One basic one for the, especially if this is for agreements that are um, a, based on APC costs, um, is what happens to the unused funds at the end of the term. So you, you want to try to build in a, a clause in your agreement that says at the end of the term, unused funds will roll over to uh, future terms. Um, there's also, uh, well, one that I mentioned is um, the, you, you don't want a clause where you're agreeing to verify eligibility. And especially you don't want a, a clause where you're agreeing to verify eligibility according to specific criteria defined by the publisher. Um, so that's something that you want to, to exclude. Um, let's see. Um, no, I guess this is not the list I thought it was. Um, the, the institutional deposits I mentioned, you want, if, if possible, you want to um, give, you want the publishers to specify in the agreement they are willing to do this automated deposit of, of things published under your agreement. Um, Curtis, I'm blanking. What else? What else? Can you think of what am I missing? Yeah, I was thinking of, you know, how you define, you know, the population that gets to author definition, who's in, who's out of the agreement. Um, there's definitely several, and this might be a good point to mention, uh, Matthew, that Matthew and I have written up a, an article that goes into a lot more depth of all of this. It's under review right now, so hopefully that'll see the light of day in the, in the coming months, and we definitely list out all of these um, in that article. Great, thank you. Looks like there is a request for you to revisit the slide. Um, in which you were explaining the process of publication and OA agreement. Hmm. Not, not sure. It looks like we not are sure. getting some clarification if we can. Okay. Um, Just tell me when to stop. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe while we're waiting on that clarification, I can ask a question. Um, you mentioned that you had, uh, you were able to permanently move some of these responsibilities to specific staff. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the impact on staff and, and existing workflows. Yeah, and, I, and Matthew can, can chip in on this, but I, I will just say at a, at a higher level, you know, we recognize that when we're asking staff to take on new responsibilities, you know, we don't have a lot of people sitting around in the building without enough to do. So when you were going to ask someone to do new things, you need to think through, um, you know, what can they stop doing? What can be shifted? Um, unfortunately, you know, we are still modernizing things in our, in acquisitions and tech services, right? We're introducing efficiencies as well. And so there wasn't like one you know, simple way to identify this, but, you know, just, I would just emphasize that consideration needs to go into not just piling things on top of like already an already full-time workload. And that's not what we did. We reassigned work. We have really, Matthew's division is new. Um, so we have actually done significant reorganization with shifting folks around and responsibilities around. So this was all part of kind of a bigger process and nesting these things where they landed. And it's largely been successful. And I think that people are actually who are involved with this work, 
they recognize that it's something new and exciting that's having an impact that aligns with, in our case at Iowa State, we're a land grant university with a mission to share the knowledge that we're creating and we talk about it that way. And so the staff that have been involved with this work, I think there's a little bit of maybe not cachet, but they feel like this is good work, meaningful work, impactful work, and they have felt, you know, largely, I think, happy to be involved with it. Matthew, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, well, just to the question of specifically like what this looks like in terms of staff workload. Um, I, I, so in my department, um, there's basically two of us that do all of what you're seeing here. Um, so I do um, most of these and, and then I have one staff that's actually doing the eligibility verification. So he's the one that sees the notifications and go, does the lookup in our institutional directory and, and says yes or no. Um, and of course, but he also helps out with with reporting um, and um, uh, some of the other some of these, yeah, the, the open access verification and and the nice thing about um, having this department is and 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 having staff who understand some of these questions is um, when there are needs to do things like you know verify a bunch of open access articles. Um, there are there are are people available to do that. So in addition to the two, the one staff member that does um, sort of is my partner on most of this, we can also um, take advantage of you know the, the the broader unit to 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 do this. And um, timing, uh, I would say between the two of us, so those that me and and my staff person, the time that we spend on all of this. Um, does it does not add up to one full-time position um and it's it's hard to be more specific than that but um yeah i think that's probably where i'd leave that thank you um it looks like we've got some clarification on the slide that the attendee was requesting the one with the arrows oh the arrows yeah <laughs> My beautiful arrows yes very professional Yes, that deserves should another. Should put another it on the look. whiteboard. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we also have another question. I think this will probably be our last question. Have you received new funding for these agreements, or are you reducing materials expenditures to free up funds? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So I, I talked at the beginning, you know, that we're a signatory of OA 2020. And the reason why I mentioned that again is because the commitment that's made under OA 2020 is to take the current subscription spend and shift it over to doing these new things. Now, the, the trick with that is that these are not typically like a one-to-one. -one. Like if we, you know, our agreement with Wiley or Oxford, you know, sometimes you can just take a previous subscription spend and make it into an open access agreement, depending on the model of the publisher and it's cost neutral. Um, if you're doing a lot of publishing with that publisher and you had a really good subscription deal, you know, your cost may go up. So we are not getting new money to do this. We are doing this within the, the budget that we have. Um, and it is requiring that we make decisions around, um, you know, we're just assessing the spend in a new way. You know, we're going from thinking about this, you know, like the cost per use procurement mindset of all of this to really more of a aligning with values, open investing mindset to it. So our conversations about how we spend our money really, really looks a lot different than it did when I got here um, five years ago. So we happen to be a little bit in a sweet spot with the size of our collection budget, with the publishing output of the university. So we have done a lot of analysis of this and we did some work with the California Digital Library and it looks to us like there is enough money in our in our collection budget with our journal spend to actually cover all of these publishing costs. Um, that's not the case for every university. You know, the research intensive universities, this is the pay it forward study work that was done six, seven years ago. Um, the University of Washington's, the Harvard's, the UC Berkeley's, you know, they have nowhere near enough money in those subscription budgets to actually cover all the publishing across their campuses. And every campus is gonna be different, you know? Um, but in our case, 
we should be able to do this in a cost neutral way. And we've had a lot of success and buy-in from campus in shifting the spend into this new direction. Thank you so much. We are out of questions and out of time. So thank you again for your presentation and just a reminder that the slides and this recording will be available in the coming weeks. So thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thanks everybody.